The cars that stand the test of time to remain in our collective memories are usually the ones produced by mainstream manufacturers. But today, you and I are fortunate enough to be in the presence of a car that has stood the test of time thanks purely to sheer presence and curiosity. But as is fitting for Twincam, it's also the British motor industry all over, at both its best and its worst. So in all its majesty, the Jensen Interceptor complete with probably the greatest name ever bestowed on a motor car. Before we get into it, this car is to be auctioned by Manor Park Classic. So if you own a small oil refinery, then please do follow the link in the description. But considering this is such a well-loved car, I'm sure most of us don't know all that much about Jensen. So before the car itself, I think it's time for a quick history lesson. Up until the 1930s, coach building was the accepted method of clothing an expensive car, and that's how brothers Alan and Richard Jensen made their name. The Jensens had worked with many of the big car manufacturers of the day, but didn't have a company of their own until taking over W.J. Smith & Sons in 1934, changing its name to Jensen Motors. Until the outbreak of the war, Jensen would continue building cars upon the chassis of others. But after the war, Jensen started building proper sports cars of their own. Through raiding the Austin parts bin, they brought us the Interceptor and 541. But in 1962, they debuted the Jensen CV8, complete with a stonking great American V8. The CV8 was quite traditional in terms of suspension. At the front, it had a set of double wishbones, which sound exotic today as they're just about the best basic setup available. But in 60s Britain, they were pretty standard, as was a live axle at the back, complete with leaf springs, and also a panard rod, just to keep things facing the right way. It may have been simple, but that was okay. It was 1962 after all, and the CV8 was fast. Incredibly fast. We regularly hold Jaguars of this era as the fastest saloons and sports cars in the world, but Jensen weren't far behind. A CV8 would do 0-60 in 8 seconds and go on to a top speed of 130 miles per hour. Plus, it had rack and pinion steering, a limited slip differential and disc brakes all round, the latter of which was incredibly unusual at the time. The problem, however, was the execution. The CV8 was more than worthy to drive, but it wasn't exactly a looker, and its fiberglass construction made it feel less than solid when compared to a cheaper, prettier, better built Jaguar. To add insult to injury, I'm not kidding when I say a Jag was cheaper. In 1962, a CV8 was nearly double the price of an E-Type. If Jensen were going to seriously compete, they needed to change tactics. They knew they needed an all-steel body, and with those American V8s in tow, they went about creating a true cross-continental Grand Tourer. The obvious feature of the Interceptor is, of course, the styling, but we'll get to that later on. For now, exacerbated by Jensen's lack of funds, the new car sat on almost exactly the same chassis as the old CV8. In fact, the wheelbase and tracks are exactly the same, making the centre of engineering, quite clearly, that big old V8. Before the 1960s, the V8 was a rather rare layout in the UK, and it was only really with the American influence that they became genuinely popular. Of course, there was the Rolls-Royce V8, the Daimler V8, and the Aston Martin V8, all of which were British designs. But Rover's V8 was, of course, an American. Roots used Ford V8s in the Sunbeam Tiger, and Jensen used Chrysler V8s. In 1965, only a year before the Interceptor came along, Jensen fitted the CV8 with a larger 6.3-litre engine and that's what was carried over to the first series of the new car. These are versions of Chrysler's B engine, the Wedge, which is a properly traditional all-iron overhead valve 90-degree V8. 
But in Europe, this kind of power unit in a GT like this wasn't quite the done thing, and that made the Interceptor unique, not having to drag every last pony out of a potentially fragile, rev-happy, smaller engine, being able to be lazy and dependable in its power and torque, enough to happily pull the Interceptor along with only a three-speed automatic. They did build 23 manuals, but only 23, because an auto suits this engine down to the ground. However, for 1971, Jensen began fitting a 7.2 litre variant of the RB engine, and that's the one fitted to this car, though in the top of the line SP with its six-pack carburettors, an interceptor could be had with up to a quoted figure of 330 brake horsepower, meaning 60 miles per hour could be achieved in under seven seconds. So on paper, the Interceptor is rather traditional and it gets its fame, let's be honest, through style and image as well as the ferocity of its power unit. But as car enthusiasts, a lot of us are always trying to find a kind of engineering lead, something tangible to grasp our interest onto beyond mere style. And that comes to the Interceptor through the Jensen FF. The FF, standing for Ferguson Formula, is an interceptor with a longer bonnet in order to accommodate the world's first production full-time four-wheel drive passenger car. The FF predates the often termed revolutionary Audi Quattro by nearly 15 years, but it doesn't stop with its four-wheel drive because alongside it is anti-lock brakes and traction control, all in 1966. The Jensen FF was widely considered one of the safest, most forgiving and sure-footed cars you could buy in 1966, but it was mightily expensive thanks to its space-age engineering, as we'll mention later. But in all fairness, the FF is really a topic for another day. So back to rear-wheel drive and the penalty of turning the CV8 into the Interceptor. You see, the two cars weren't just traditionally suspended, but traditionally constructed too, with the same separate chassis clothed in the appropriate style, leading to a weight penalty of 152 kilograms. This meant the Interceptor had to be marketed as a Grand Tourer, as it was far too heavy to be a sports car. It was still monstrously fast in a straight line and wouldn't disgrace itself in the corners, but this is a car for travelling down to Monaco in. And doesn't it just look the part? It's a spectacular looking thing. The presence of the Interceptor, I think, is still unmatched, coming up to 60 years later. But weirdly, I think the styling is slightly disjointed. It looks as though it's been thrashed together out of different bits, but those bits are all so good that you can't really help but just sit and admire this car. In developing it, Jensen did almost none of the work themselves. After all, the engine was from Chrysler and the chassis was pre-existing. And for this incredibly Italian looking body, wouldn't you guess, they went to Italy and a mixture of Vignale and Touring, who designed and built early Interceptor bodies before full production moved over to England. But I can't imagine what it must have been like at Earl's Court in 1966, because Jensen, a company who built strange looking and curvy little cars out of fiberglass, had brought us this. Probably the most exotic looking car that had ever come out of Britain, regardless of its Italian style. I wouldn't ever say it's a pretty car, and I absolutely stand by my point about it being bitsy, but it's all about presence. It's about those hooded headlamps, the majestic rear glass, and the reclined bulbousness of the side profile. Then there's the name. What a car. But the Interceptor is much rarer than most of us think it is. It's a car that remains so alive in our collective memory, but Jensen was a tiny manufacturer, and across 10 years, they built fewer than 7,500. And that's across all types of Interceptor, including the FF, the SP, and the incredibly rare convertible and coupe. 
Taking that into account, as well as the old CV8 price tag, it won't surprise you to hear that the Interceptor was appallingly expensive. In 1968, one of these would have cost you £4,460. That's more than double an E-Type, and it was a couple of hundred pounds more than even a Mercedes SL or an Aston Martin DB6. Just to add fuel to the fire, a Jensen FF was all the way up at £6,018, and that's far more than an Aston Martin DBS or even a Bristol 410. This is all in spite of the fact that this was Jensen's most successful car, and it was incredibly cool, but in the event, it couldn't do anything to save them. Jensen, as I said, was a very small company, so they didn't have much of a halo around them, as the likes of Ferrari or Aston Martin did. As a result, the Interceptor was a connoisseur's choice, something properly left of field. In 1972, it was joined by the little Jensen Healey sports car, but as the oil crisis began, what demand there was for huge V8 GTs almost totally dried up. We've seen this affect a few manufacturers before on TwinCam, including Jaguar with their 12-cylinder engines, but without the sales volumes or financial support to save them, Jensen went bust in 1976. And with that, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.